My name is Alyssa Kirkoff, and I am guest hosting Kansas Farm Bureau's Inside Ag Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ashley Westerhold, Director of the Office of Farm and Ranch Transition at Kansas State, and my husband, Colin Kirkoff. We've asked Ashley to visit with us today about her experiences helping families work through the farm and ranch transition process. Our family is currently working through the process with Ashley, and it's opened up some fascinating conversations. So Ashley, if you can start us off by telling a little bit about your background and why you were drawn to helping families navigate these transitions. Yeah, so I grew up in North Georgia, so Northeast Georgia. You can hear that I do not have a Southern accent. Unfortunately, I was raised by a Nebraskan and a person from Illinois. And so I just have the Midwest no accent. And I'm very happy about that. But a lot of people were disappointed at no Southern accent when I went to school at Nebraska. Um, So I came from the first generation off the farm. There were a couple of family things that happened in our lifetime to make it to where we could not return to the farm. But I always knew I wanted to be in agriculture. My aunt in Illinois still owns a farm corn soybean operation in Huntley, Illinois, and I would go visit the farm every summer. I thought I wanted to be an ag engineer, so I went to Nebraska like my dad did, um, majoring in ag engineering. I found out that I could not even try to pass farmer physics is what we called it. And so I did not know how I would be an engineer. So in that same semester, I took Ag Econ 141, which is intro into ag economics with Dr. Ron Hansen at the University of Nebraska. And he made me fall in love with economics and Ag Econ and so the micro economy And what he also piqued my interest is his whole extension programming or programming that he had done since 1979 was helping farm families through the transition process. And that's because his story is one day he came home from the farm and his mom and dad were packing up because they were kicked off of the farm after grandpa passed away because the brother forced him to sell. So there are a lot of stories like that Um, in my family on my dad's side. My dad's dad passed away and my dad was eight years old and there wasn't a plan. My grandpa was very young. My grandma didn't know how to support the boys on the farm. And so she had to move to town and sell the farm. So there are so many stories of reasons why ag legacies were not continued. And Dr. Hansen just showed me how I could turn that into a career for myself of working with these farm families to discuss planning, um, planning for the future of the farm, planning for that farm legacy, how to protect that farm legacy, and that families need these conversations and need to be having these conversations. So that really piqued my interest. I My first job outside of my master's, I received my master's in Ag Econ from Nebraska as well, was going to the University of Idaho where I got to work in extension for University of Idaho. And my main extension program was succession planning for farm families. I got mediation training. So I am a trained mediator and facilitator, and I help farm families through the process of communication and talking about family dynamics and family succession planning. And that led me to K-State. There was a role, the role that I'm currently in, that was posted so that I could work with farm families full-time on transition planning and succession planning. I came on in February of 2022, And I've hit the ground running ever since, but really all the stories that I've heard along the way of the lack of planning just fueled my passion more and more um, to go into family transitions and helping families navigate these really hard topics. Um, And so that's kind of what led me here today. Well, we're so glad that you found your way to Kansas and to K-State and and helping families like ours. So now that you've been in your role for a little over a year, what is, what's the pulse of farm family transition in Kansas? So what do some of these successions look like? Um, Are you seeing lots of success? Are you seeing lots of challenges? Just talk about, talk about your experience in this last year. 
So I will say this last year has been a tough one just because of where the weather has been for families and what the markets have looked like, what prices are um, for input costs and other things that the pulse is probably not as normal um, just because we are dealing with very, very high input prices, barely any crops coming out of the field with the drought, lots of concern about how to pay for things without adding that next generation in. Um, and so there's already stress on family just by cyclical weather patterns in farming. And then you're talking about wanting to transition out in a bad year potentially. And that's a really scary thought. Um, and so I've been dealing with a lot of how do we make this work if this year is very low wheat crop. Um, so our wheat's very bad. There's not enough feed for our cows. A lot of cows are being liquidated. Um, so the farm economy hasn't been great the past year to make people think, oh, I could retire now. Um, and so how do we navigate that transition to where it's not a one day event of retirement, but a process that can be worked through so that when you have these bad years, there's a plan or a way of making it up over a certain number of time, but you're still working towards that retirement. So I would say that is the majority of the families that I've been working with that are doing what I call traditional family succession. Traditional meaning that you have a successor that you are currently working with or wanting to work with that are a family member. And so I work with traditional. So that means, again, it's a family member succession. And then I work with non-traditional, which means that it's not someone necessarily in direct lineage, um, or it could be a neighbor, or it could be um, someone you're trying to find. So our landling program ties into that. I would say their operations for the non-traditional look a lot different um, just because the person that they're bringing in is not a child. Um, their relationship is strictly business kind of first, and then they're building that trust aspect um, along the way, whereas families, you inherently trust these people as family members but then you have to start looking at them differently as business partners. And I think that's a very big hurdle um, that a lot of families face, not only in Kansas, but all over. Uh, but I do think that's some of the topics of conversation is how to look at this child as a business partner and not just as your child or subordinate. So kind of what the pulse is, some challenges, so a lot of people talk about the tax implications of selling equipment or selling land. And I think a lot of people view that as a challenge. I've had a lot of people interested in Medicaid, Medicare planning. So that is becoming, I think, a big challenge when we talk about succession planning is how do we prepare for someone going into a home and how do we protect the farm from someone going into a home? So that's some of the different things that I've seen this year. Some of kind of the successes that I would say are the continued communication between the families that I'm working with. Like your family, we've had multiple meetings and I feel like every meeting we get more fruitful, deeper conversations. And that's been a huge success. Some families I have taken and we are in partnership agreements. We have worked into kind of a timeline of transfer over time, what that looks like, and putting things in writing. Um, I think a challenge that a lot of producers face is you have all these great ideas, somehow it never gets put on paper or it never becomes a legal document. And then we see kind of those challenges that come with that. I really liked how you talked about traditional versus non-traditional transitions. Um, I think a lot of us don't think about those non-traditional transitions. And I kind of wonder, when, when do families or businesses decide that it's time? What are some reasons that families decide that this is the year we're going to reach out and start this process? So I wish that people were more proactive than they are, but most people reach out to me because there's a problem. Or maybe the matriarch or patriarch that were in their 80s just passed away 
and so there's a transition happening and then you're thinking about the 65 year old wanting to transition it to the next generation. Again, most families reach out to me because there is a current looming issue that they see. I would say that maybe 10% of the people that reach out to me are being proactive or the people that reach out to me have lived through something that is not great and the transition didn't work out and they realize they need to be proactive because someone else was not. I think the younger generation thinks of ideas of retirement. And so they are planning a little bit further out and thinking about that stepping stone um, where the older generations were just trying to survive and not necessarily thinking of diversifying assets or other things. So I'm talking to a lot more younger families and the process of their transition, even if it's in 20 years. Um, so that's good news. But a lot of people first reach out to me because there's a communication issue. There's a family dispute. There's a breakdown in communication. So dad won't tell us what he wants or mom ha holds all the cards and we don't know what she is planning. Or again, someone passed away and there's already estate planning issues that are involved. So. Um, so now we'll pivot to Colin. Uh, so Colin and I moved back following my vet school graduation, and you have worked off the farm um, up in Kutil kind of now. But what um, you, you took the initiative in our family to work towards formally talking about a transition. So what motivated you to start that process, and, and what really did you hope to gain? Well, once we'd moved back, it's been several years, and I'm off farm trying to find the way back into the farm. And I realize it's one of those things that's not going to happen on its own. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I've heard individuals like Elaine Fraze up in Canada. Oklahoma State has resources. And Kansas Farm Management Association has a podcast that runs through a workbook on transition. And it, it seemed like it, there was no time like the present to get started. There was a lot of work to be done. And uh, for me, I had came across when Ashley first came. I heard on this podcast, I heard the, about the Office of Farm and Ranch Transition. I thought this is a perfect opportunity. It's in our backyard. And, and thus far, it's been a very beneficial way to get the ball rolling and things started in the transition process. We felt like you came at just the right time. We were working through some stuff on our own and it really, I think it really helped to have formal process with a, a person outside of the family to help guide you through. Exactly. I think having someone that knows and has direction helps us find our thoughts and get on the same page and move in unison in the right direction. And seeing the other side. That was a huge value. The, the way you present the information to everyone, it helps us see, mm -hmm. see where your sibling is coming from, where parents are coming from, and we really appreciate that. Thank you. I think a lot of my job is asking the right questions or trying to ask the right questions that people, if they're just in their family setting, don't necessarily feel comfortable asking those questions or they don't wanna seem like they're coming from a bad place asking those questions. And so a lot of my job are just getting the people that need to be involved around a table and asking them the questions that need answers. I would say that is the majority of my job is making you all aware of what each other want as goals, as aspirations, and how can we get there and what are some of the challenges that we will see throughout this process to make sure that everyone can achieve what they want over that time? So you mentioned those challenges um, going forward and throughout the conversation. So what typically, what kind of gives families pause or what, what hangs them up as they move forward? So what's the tough stuff you have to work through? A lot of families are very good about sweeping things under the rug and not talking about them. And so there might have been an argument between two brothers five years ago that was never addressed. And now we're trying to make a decision about 
maybe purchasing a new piece of equipment or expanding an operation over an enterprise over a different enterprise. So say one sibling is really into building the cow herd, um, the cow calf side, the other sibling is more heavy on the crop side and you all are working collectively together, maybe with mom or dad, and one wants to make an investment in one aspect. But if they had an issue about something five years ago, it might become a roadblock to make that decision and make it um, clear-minded and make it the best kind of financial decision or whatever that might be. And so I do think communication is always the number one roadblock within farm families. We're very good about talking about the weather or talking about what our plans are for the day or talking about where production is. But we are very bad about talking about our feelings or our goals or our aspirations and how to tie that in with how the farm is doing. I, I do think that's our biggest challenge is how do we relearn how to communicate with each other if we're family members and have been communicating this way our whole lives. And so some of the family meetings I have are just about basic communication of what are the needs of everyone in the family for communication. Um, so if dad doesn't answer text messages, you probably shouldn't send him text message updates about what you are doing in the field. So you have to actually take time out of your day and call dad to update him, which sometimes can feel like a chore. But when you think about older generations communicating together, a lot of them, they were on the phone all day together. Um, and that's how they communicate or they met up for lunch together every day to have those conversations. So how do we communicate together that all of us feel comfortable with what's happening on the farm, what's happening for the future of the farm and what we're working towards. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, and I think about like kind of our family um, and, and our conversations working with you, we've, we've assumed, I think each one of us can say that maybe we've assumed that one family member felt a certain way and we have nothing to back that up. So, so assumptions have really been something I think Colin and I have had to work on a little bit. Do you see that in other families as well? We are so good about the way we think, we think others think that way. So the way that we process our feelings or actions, we think of it, if we did that action, what was our intention behind it? And so we make assumptions about intentions um, and that can be a very hard place again to come from, because if you make this decision, what was your intent behind it? And we try to put ourselves in their shoes. Um, and sometimes that's the wrong assumption. And that can lead to a lot of arguments or frustrations or animosity. And there's not really a reason for it. And so that's hard. I think there's assumptions that are made all the time. So some of the assumptions that I see maybe the older generation thinking of the younger is they're going to take over this farm and run it just the way that I ran it for the last 20 years. And for any challenge that that younger generation presents to patriarch or matriarch, it's, well, I assumed you would just take this over and you weren't going to make any changes and it's productive the way it is and it's profitable. So there's a lot of assumptions that way. And then when they are not meeting those assumptions too, or expectations, then hurt feelings come or lack of trust or whatever it could be. There's many assumptions I do like in your example, it's kind of interested on farm and then interested off farm. And what are the assumptions of the off farm heirs that you have? So oh, they're gonna want half the land because it's their parents too. Um, and they would just keep it or they would sell it or whatever it might be. And so we're thinking of doom and gloom usually in those assumptions, which then could scare you guys or say like, mom and dad, we have to protect this land from sisters selling it. And maybe those siblings have never even thought about the idea of owning land someday or what that might look like because we've never asked them. 
So those assumptions can get out of hand quickly and that can kind of lead to, again, fighting amongst siblings. And that's not a great place when you're trying to make plans for the future. Colin, so we've talked about our tendency to assume. So obviously our farm transition is like many others and it's not perfect. There's been bumps along the way. Uh, so it's, it's hard to talk about change and especially change that potentially involves death and loss. So what are some things that you'd like to see our family work on as we move forward um, with our transition and working with, with Ashley? Moving forward, what do you want to see? And then what do you think we have improved upon so far? So what are we better at? Well, I'll reverse the questions <laughs> to answer that. I think we have done a better job about talking about the uncomfortable things and discussing them, getting out in the open, cleaning up some of the assumptions and learning what others in the family are thinking. However, on that, and I think it's probably for all farm families is the, the hardest thing is finding the time. So we talk about these things in theory and then following up and executing and taking the time out to make sure that we continue the conversation and that the conversation is fruitful and an action is done is probably the hardest thing to do. And one of those actions is just continuing the conversation and making a designated time to discuss it and to keep doing action steps going forward. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So addressing what needs addressed and and oftentimes that is conflict based. Uh, So Ashley, back to you. So I'm sure many families are like ours where they are conflict adverse. And you you mentioned that previously. Families are are great at shoving things under the rug. So we sacrifice communication and sometimes business growth um, to keep the peace. How do you suggest that families approach these really hard initial conversations to set them up for success? So when I work with families, In mediation, I was taught we have to set ground rules. I like when I have a family meeting to set a just blanket ground rules of the meeting. Things like you will not be on your phone during this meeting to show respect. You will show respect by not interrupting. Um, You will be honest in these conversations. What is said here can stay here unless the group decides to share it outside of the core group that's here today. They're just ground rules to make sure that everyone knows the seriousness of this conversation, how serious we as family members in that situation are taking it because we are agreeing to the terms of these ground rules to have this conversation. There have been family meetings that have been fueled with conflict that one time there was yelling and we had to bring it back to really rephrase and reframe statements that were made that were with a raised voice to make sure that everyone understands the feelings and the intent behind it. Um, I would say that It's really hard to have conflict, again, and especially farm families. Everyone wants their family to be the picture-perfect family that doesn't have conflict. Even non-farm families want that. Um, But when you have conflict, addressing it, allowing space to receive that feedback or receive those feelings, um, I think is a really beautiful thing. So if you had a hard time approaching a parent and your feelings are very hurt, um, and there's conflict that arose and you felt like you weren't heard, a family meeting with ground rules, I think, allows you to feel comfortable to share in that space um, and understand that someone's not going to interrupt you. um, Someone's not going to take it the wrong way because you kind of have that interpreter there as a mediator to really put it in words that are actions and are valid feelings and make sure the other side can understand where that part comes from. If you hear that they're very upset because one sibling received a compensation package and the other just is working at an hourly wage, what is the breakdown? What are the conflicts? Why 
did that happen? So again, as I am there to try to ask the hard questions of why is there a discrepancy? And it sounds like a lot of the conflict is coming from the unknown of knowing why this one got a compensation package versus this one who's hourly. The one who has a compensation package might just came out of a five-year career as a crop consultant or an agronomy uh, position, and they're bringing back to the farm education, experience, and they wanted a compensation package, and they knew it was an opportunity to negotiate in that way. And the one who just came maybe back from high school or whatever it might be has worked for an hourly wage for however long and did not know about renegotiation or anything. And so there's a lot of honesty and transparency that has to also be in this meeting. And I think the honesty and transparency, even though it might hurt feelings, feels more comfortable for farm families than sometimes basic communication. So as long as people are being honest and they feel like they're um, being heard, I think a lot of success comes from that. That's fantastic advice. And I, you're a toddler parent and we are toddler parents. And I feel like it's in the farm transitions and raising toddlers, we're doing the same thing. So we all need that reminder of how to have those hard conversations and do so where everybody feels comfortable and heard and valued. So thank you. That was, that was excellent. So Colin, as we've worked through the initial steps of the process, you and I have talked a lot about planning for our transition from the get-go. So how we will leave um, our business to our children. So tell, tell us a little bit about these conversations and, and your thoughts. Well, being about a, a year into this process, it's clear that it is a process and it's never, it's never a finished thing. It, it is always evolving and changing. It becomes more evident in in anticipation as time goes on that farms will have more equity, more assets, it's going to become more challenging for the future. It, it appears that for us, we need to, at least if we're going to offer that opportunity to any successing generations that we start now and always have that thought process in mind. I think maybe prior generations transition in a particular way in the nature of agriculture and farm business is immensely different and ever, ever changing. And so to me, it seems more important that than ever that we need to present the opportunity for our children, um, definitely not force it upon, which isn't really an issue. It's just, I think that we need to start early and always keep the opportunity open. I liked how you talked about the process might be different than that of our parents or our grandparents. And, and really, it's because the agricultural space is so much different. So as we move forward, we've brainstormed and, and you've done a fantastic job of both looking and thinking outside of the box. So to make transitions work, partnerships theoretically can include more than just family. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to build your bench, to find the experts in the field, and to allocate opportunities to those who excel. So you, one of your strengths is seeing things differently and finding those opportunities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think our relationship with Ashley might be an example of that, looking and finding a resource that's there. Like I said, agriculture and ag business in the farm is ever evolving. So I think that uh, we have to always be ready to pivot and be willing to look into new opportunities, transitioning to farming is different than prior generations. Uh, it's not, I'm going to come home and raise cows and raise my crops and do it the same way. And so therefore, I think we need to look and utilize and seek out those resources. You listen to more podcasts than I think anybody I know and, uh, and digest information in a way that really propels you to think about the future in a way that's possible. I think Can Colin's you... outside perspective of being not on the farm full time before coming back to the farm. So he had a job in the bank banking industry. He understands the value of having a larger team and values business consultants or people that can help in different aspects of the farm. 
where I think one of the challenges in the farming community is a lack of trust for outside assistance um, or being afraid to ask for help. Um, and so I think that we're very, in the farming community, we trust our accountant and we trust our banker. And those are really the two kind of outside sources that farm families have felt comfortable with. But if you think about other businesses that are not farm or ranch operations, they have a way larger team that might be included in that. And that could be communication HR type conversations or people that can help in those topic areas. And so as a farming community, as younger people who have been in industry before coming back to the farm, I think the idea of having outside resources to help is becoming more known and more accepted, which I am excited for um, just because you don't, it's like the talking about mental health has been a stigma. Talking about needing any type of help is very stigmatized in small rural areas. And so even asking for help in succession planning has been a difficult step for so many people. Um, and I think that needs to change of, we need to look to professionals to help where we don't feel comfortable approaching these subjects. And we need to know where to find these professionals and how to use them. Um, a big part of my job too is making sure the business is okay before we start talking about the transition. And so I would say, an ideal transition is making sure the business is set up in a way that it can be transitioned the easiest, the best way possible. Um, I know that my favorite transition cases are where there's entities already involved. It's very clean cut. How can we start incorporating people to come into the business and start working their way in in a way that makes sense business-wise um, in looking at the farm and ranch as a business. And I think, again, it's becoming more evident that we need tools to use on the farm, like LLCs, like partnerships, like other entities to evolve into a business structure. So it's easier for people to come in and out of. Um, sole proprietorship, once you go away, you're where's your business? What What is the business? Who has those assets? Did you declare where all of those assets go? If you did business planning, and then we talk about succession as a part of that business, um, it just becomes a lot cleaner, a lot simpler to understand. And you've kind of been working on this for a long time because you saw the need of putting this into a business structure, building it as a business, and then you would transfer the business instead of just assets. A lot of people get really concentrated on the estate plan and usually complete the estate plan fairly early um, just because you're scared if I pass away and my kids are 12, where are they going to go? And so I created an estate plan when they were 12 and now they are 35. And that's my estate plan still. Um, I have seen so many people across Kansas who have not updated their trust in 20 plus years. And it's just one of those things that make sure the business is okay. And then we can talk about estate planning later, but the business, if you're worried about succession, needs to come first and make sure the business is viable and able to support a next generation. I'd say that that's one of my biggest hurdles is making sure that people have solid business plan before thinking about succession and making sure that the business is okay. And then we can talk about succession. I love that. Cause even I'm looking at my notes for this conversation. And my next question was to ask you about people's estates prior to their business. So having that business solvent, even prior to, to having some of those minimums um, on the estate level, maybe for our younger listeners, who haven't maybe haven't had children yet or haven't had to kind of tackle those initial um, initial estate building tasks. What's the bare minimum that an individual would need to ensure that their future is protected? 
So I say everyone should have a basic will, um, because if you don't have one, then the government will use their plan for you. And so right now, what it says is that if you were to pass away without a will, um, half your assets would go to your spouse, and then half your assets would go to your children, and no matter what age they are. So that might not be what you would like. And so those are assets that are held individually. So if they are joint assets, they would go to the spouse. But there's things like that, that people are not aware of. So if they have they pass away with nothing in test state and they have to go to probate. Um, those are kind of the rules right now of what that looks like. So if you have minor children, again, you should have a will and then minor designations. Where do your children go if you and your spouse were to pass away? Make sure that you have those or you and your spouse never ride together, never take a plane ride together, never go on a trip together, are never in the same place at the same time. If a tornado is coming, you guys are in separate basements, um, in separate houses. So you need to have those minor designations. Uh, power of attorneys. So there's a power of attorney for your financials and a power of attorney for healthcare decisions. Um, and so you could have separate person for each of those. You could have the same person for each of those. Um, really does not matter on that. Um, I'd say if you are younger, the idea of a will is really designating what your assets are right now and um, designating where your children goes. You should have basic estate planning documents your kind of whole life. But as the business change, as you add more people into the family, these estate planning documents should be changing with your life. You might not have many assets today, but in 10 years, I've hoped you have grown. I hope you're seeing different things. Um, and I hope you might be thinking about a different future where, oh, we have maybe an 18 year old now who is showing interest in the farm. Does that mean all three things should go into undivided interest or not? And start having those conversations. Um, but estate planning documents should not be something we're not touching for 20 plus years. And I just encourage you, if you have one that you created in the 90s and things have changed since then, please, please go and look at those documents. Think about updating them. It might not be what your wishes are um, today, like it was 30, 20 years ago. So I know for Colin and I, it seems like it, that was always something that we had to do and we had to do. And we probably procrastinated more on our will and, and our um, kind of our general estate than we did with a farm. And in retrospect, that's kind of scary. And thanks for the reminder to update it. That's, it's, a, it's an ever-changing document. Yeah, you guys just had another kid. So yeah, we got we to gotta add them in. Add, um, and make sure that whoever is getting the kids can accept a third one now. And yeah. so just, again, every death or every birth or every life change, um, some people have minor designations of friends that they haven't talked to in 10 years. And that's because when they set it up, that's who they were friends with at the time. And it's not that case anymore. So really need to update those as things change. And I recommend looking at those documents every once in a while. So when we were talking with Colin, we talked about how farming is different. It's not the same as what it was 20 years ago. Ashley, how is that transition space changing um, with the change of the times? If you think about transitions from kind of the traditionalist to the baby boomers, it might have happened later in life. Um, it might have happened earlier in life, but the land prices were a lot lower potentially than they are today. So it depends on when they transition. But if you're thinking about transitioning happened in the 80s, or even the 90s, the land prices are night and day difference than where they are today. Also, the price of machinery and equipment, way different ball game we are in today than we were back then. Um, the idea of competitiveness and needing large scale operations to be maybe profitable. Um, I think a lot of people 
that grew up in a different time, they could live off of a quarter section or just a half section. And now it's almost impossible to make that cash flow and support a family. We're trying to think of this new farm lifestyle. It's just so much bigger. It is so much more money. And what that brings is more issues with the estate planning, with succession planning of how could we ask this younger generation to buy out a $6 million business? And I also can't potentially retire without some income from that $6 million business because that's where I invested all of my money for the last 40, 50 plus years. And so we are dealing with that. Um, I think a lot of my job is looking at what are we comfortable retiring with? What does each party need? What do they feel like they can afford? What would you be willing to give? Or what are you willing to receive? Some people, they don't want the tax consequences. So they're really wanting to gift. But what does that do for the next generation? What does that do to stepped up basis? What are those kind of conversations. Um, I do think that back then, a $500,000 life insurance policy bought off-farm siblings out of a good chunk of land. Today, it does not. Um, you're thinking about land prices. An average farm in Kansas, I would say the land just by itself, I'm looking at two to $3 million for just an average farm size in Kansas. Um, so if you gave, again, the on-farm child two to $3 million worth of farmland and the off-farm child 500000 in a cash policy, it doesn't look equal. It does not look close to equal. But having those tough conversations, having parents explain why they're doing this, using tools um, to make sure that if there is that discrepancy how can we protect if that off or on farm child decides to sell that farm and become that millionaire? Um, but really having those conversations of just because it looks like they're getting $3 million worth of assets doesn't mean they will ever hold $3 million worth of cash in their hand to go live out in the Bahamas or whatever it might be. And so having those tough conversations, but it is a lot different just because we don't have equalized assets or asset bases um, as much as we did back then. So again, life insurance, it's only small piece of some of these farm sizes and the equipment. I mean, $500,000 is a new combine. Um, and so it's, it's a big discrepancy. And we have people who did not invest anywhere but the farm. And I do think that the next generation is looking more at diversifying and more comfortable diversifying and has more trust of diversified assets um, than older generations did. So it's just, it's a different ball game. Um, but I would say the main thing is tools that we use to try to equalize estates are not necessarily there anymore. And we weren't able to save as much as generations before either. So some older generations had 200,000 in cash hiding in their house. Um, and we are not seeing that on balance sheets anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely do not have $200,000 hidden in our house somewhere. So, Well, unless your dad has gold bars <laughs> hidden somewhere around the house. Um, but it's, it's really hard to equalize the states or try to be close. It's so capitally intensive and, and the competition. You mentioned both of those things. So if you um, are interested in agriculture and you don't have those opportunities, I, I believe you guys have a land link program. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So like at the beginning, I was talking about non-traditional transition plans. And so I We have a land link program. It's called Kansas Land Link. Um, you can Google it. You can go to agcansitions.org and you can find all the information on Kansas Land Link on there. Um, but what we are trying to do is match land seekers that are interested in farming full time or taking on more acres or whatever they're kind of comfortable seeking 
looking for land um, with those who are retiring, trying to retire, and do not have someone interested in taking over. Um, and so right now we have about 17 landowners and 70 land seekers in our program. Um, land link programs across the country usually have a 20 to one land seeker to landowner ratio. And so because it's within kind of our first year of launching it, uh, we expect those numbers to be closer to that 20 to one ratio. Um, what my office does is we take applications from both the landowner and land seeker. I individually interview the parties, and then I try to make suggestions on matches. Um, the landowner information is completely private unless they tell me not. Um, and the land seekers information will be sent to landowners based on their needs, their wants, and the opportunities. We are, again, in the first year of this process. We have not had a match in the system yet, but two of our land loan landowners have found matches inside their community. And so they were able to get a match by, I like to say, using our program and using the tools of how to ask questions to these land seekers. Um, and they were able to find land seekers that were closer to home for them. So um, I would call that a success. But we are hopeful that we'll have a match here soon. Again, if you're interested, check out the website, submit an application. We have landowners that are very serious about finding someone, um, especially if you are willing to move. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities for you. Um, it's just hard because a lot of our land seekers are already land tied um, to a parent's operation, an uncle's operation or whatever. And so it seems that our land seekers are not where our landowners are. Um, and so it's an opportunity for those who are still looking to definitely sign up for the program. Such a cool opportunity for the right people. And I, I can't wait to hear about the future successes you guys have. Aside from your office, Ashley, what are some other resources that you like to direct um, families to to get started on the process? Yeah, so um, like KFMA did, um, they did a podcast series. So Kansas Farm Management Association is KFMA. Um, they did a podcast series about the Wisconsin workbook for farm transitions. And that is a self-paced workbook that you could use with your family to kind of see where you are, what are some things that you have not addressed. Um, and I would say that's a good tool to use that I like to direct families to if they feel like they can start these initial conversations kind of by themselves. Um, I also like to tell people on any kind of platform now about Kansas farm stress. We understand that this drought, that farm succession, that there are a lot of stressors in the farm community. And I just want people to be aware that we do have Kansas Farm Stress by KDA. They have a whole website that you can reach out to and just look at resources um, for you if you are interested or if you are worried about a neighbor, a friend, whatever it might be. Additionally, I just can't recommend enough agmanager.info if you guys need any production information or any publications or interested in market updates, whatever that might be. We have cost of production estimates. Um, and so if you need financial resources or other type of educational pieces, definitely look at agmanager.info, which is just the Kansas State University Ag Econ's hub of resources, essentially. I'd say really look at ag stress, ag financials, and then ag succession planning, because that's my bread and butter, and you need to incorporate or be aware of all of them uh, when going through this process. That's a great reminder about ag stress. I think so often we kind of shove that to the side and try to tackle the business and the family aspects and then forget about taking care of ourselves. So we'll have to check that out. I haven't looked at that one yet before. So in parting, Ashley, do you have a challenge or an action step that you'd like to extend to our listeners? I would say before 
thinking about succession planning, think about your individual goals and try to be on the same page with your spouse. And then you can take it from there. If you think about your goals and not aspirations, share them. Share them with a friend, share them with your spouse, and then share them with a family member. And maybe that's how you open this conversation. But I would just say, if you have windshield time, if you're in the tractor, if you are doing something right now, listening to this podcast, think about what the future looks like for you. And then what do I need to do to start that conversation? And I think a good thing is starting with yourself. It's a lot easier to start having those conversations with yourself and then move forward from there. Hopefully we have a lot of good conversations that stem from this. So Ashley and Colin, I, I really appreciate your time and your thoughtful discussion. Um, Ashley, if people have further questions or would like to utilize your office's resource, what's the way that you prefer people get in contact with you? So if you are a person that likes to pick up the phone and call, you can reach me at 785-532-4526. If you are a person who likes emailing, which is my most preferred way of contact, just because my phone is always with me, my office phone is not with me all the time. Um, And that is just Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-E-C-W at ksu.edu and you can reach out to me. We also have a work email that is agcansitions, so A-G-K-A-N-S-I-T-I-O-N-S at ksu.edu and either email will come to my desk. Please reach out to me. I will answer emails. Unfortunately, I am addicted to answering emails and so I usually answer all times of day Um, but those phone calls are usually between eight and five. Thank you, Ashley.